Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayers on Tuesday, September 22. Let's begin with our opening sentences. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. From Psalm 51. I pray to you, O Lord, you hear my voice in the morning. At sunrise I offer my prayer and wait for your answer. From Psalm 5. Our morning psalm this morning is Psalm 105, verses 1 to 22. O give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When they were few in number, of little account and strangers in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. When he summoned famine against the land and broke every staff of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord kept testing him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to instruct his officials at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. And our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 37, verses 17b to 28. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. This journey of Joseph's here in this passage can be read in so many ways. On the one hand, this journey saves Joseph's life. It's an escape hatch out of a deadly situation. It's rescue and hope and a second chance. Of course, on the other hand, he's sold into slavery and trafficked into a foreign country. This situation is barely less dangerous than being trapped in a pit by murderous brothers. So, like much of life, there's both hope and desperation here. Again, I think it's easy for us to read this text, hopefully, because we know the ending. God strategically places Joseph to provide famine relief for Egypt and all their neighbors, including Joseph's murderous brothers, facilitating forgiveness and reconciliation. 
So really, it's a good thing that Joseph winds up in Egypt. But it's a hard thing, too. At this point, Joseph still has the false accusations of Potiphar's wife ahead of him, plus jail time, plus a lot of scary situations of broken promises and speaking uncomfortable truths to powerful people who hold his life in their hands. And at this point in his life, likely tied up and tossed on the back of a camel or forced to walk alongside the trader's caravan, his family and homeland disappearing over the horizon behind him, likely never to be seen again. This has to be a moment of intense grief for him. And it's true that Joseph never settled in his homeland again. He made his home in Egypt for the rest of his life. For Joseph, there was no going back again. So much good comes out of the brothers' crime and lies and Joseph's forced journey. But we mustn't let that good diminish our understanding of the human toll, the pain and fear and grief and loss that are also part of this journey. We know Jacob mourned the loss of his son, and I'm sure Joseph mourned for the loss of everything he'd ever known. It's possible that Joseph was thinking that the best days of his life were already behind him. I hope that Joseph was able in this moment to have some hope, to know that God was with him, to understand that this wasn't the end, to hold on to the truth that this journey for all its downsides was still an escape from a bad situation, a preservation of his life, and a chance to wake up the next morning and keep going. We don't always choose which journeys we take or the circumstances under which we get to embark, or even if we get to come home again. But even the most painful, scary, unwelcome trips can bring a sort of deliverance. May Joseph's story remind us that when we are sent on trips we'd rather not take, that there is hope and that God is with us. Amen. Please join me now in a time of prayer and thanksgiving. Satisfy us with your love in the morning and we will live this day in joy and praise. From Psalm 90. Eternal God, we rejoice this morning in the gift of life which we have received by your grace and the new life you give in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for the love of our families, the affection of our friends, strength and abilities to serve your purpose today, this community in which we live and opportunities to give as we have received. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to serve them even as we have been served in Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for those closest to us, our families, our friends, our neighbors, refugees and homeless men, women and children, the outcast and persecuted, those from whom we are estranged, your church in Africa. And for those you have given us to pray for in particular, we rejoice with Beth Byrne. We pray for healing for Pastor Johanna, for Susan Lawson, for Kathy Cecil, for Asia, and for Devon Powers. We pray for protection for Russ, and we pray for comfort for Ellen. God of our salvation, as the light of morning dawns, heaven and earth sing your praise. Cause us to live and grow in faith so that we may bear good fruit for the glory of your holy realm. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me now in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go today with this blessing from the book of Second Peter. 
May we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised.